Come on, frame this then, put cat out, pour tea and sit down. It's time for Act Tracks. <laughs> Direct from Bradford, West Yorkshire Eight hat tracks With the one and only Daz in the hat Hello, this is Monologue John Barclay going to do a series of poems or monologues for you. This first one was written by Roy Blackman, who lives in Rotherham. Uh, he got the idea from a, a, a tea towel, in fact. I worked for a family firm called Body, Body, Body and Body. The four directors were anybody, everybody, somebody, and nobody. All the sons of Billy Body, the founding body, the late body, the dead body. But everybody knew the firm had financial problems. Nobody knew where the money went, it was anybody's guess. The shop steward, Peabody, thought he should go to everybody and that upset somebody. You never guessed what this firm made. Bodies, car bodies, bus bodies, fire engine bodies, tractor bodies, lorry bodies, red lorry bodies, yellow lorry bodies, there were red and yellow lorry bodies all over. Everybody's sons worked there, but they were nobodies. Somebody's daughter thought she was somebody, but she was anybody and everybody's, and there were absolutely nobody who hadn't been on the body with her according to all the busybodies. The end came on a two-minute job that wasn't done. It cost the fair millions. Everybody knew it needed doing. Anybody could have done it. Someone was off sick. And nobody bothered. Me? I'm not doing it. It's not my job. I'm just a bodyguard. Anyway, my name's not body. It's Soul. Richard Soul. I'm just trying to keep body and soul together. But I'm not the only uh, soul in this firm. And I told everybody that I wasn't going to do anybody's dog's body's job for nobody. And now everybody's out of work. And I'm looking for a job with anybody. Next one is about um, uh, when the M62 came through, uh, what the, um, a, a certain amount of, um, uh, of havoc that it caused. Written by a bloke called Al Potts. I've never actually met him. Uh, whether he, he's still around here or not, I really don't know. New motorways coming. There's nought we can do. Our house and our street will be riven in two, so as I them lung lorries and cars can rush through. And we're bound to be flitting in the morning. It's months ago now since that fancy young chap came from council to talk about new Pennine Gap. To us it was not but a line on the map, but it meant we were flitting in the morning. Our Uncle Tom's farmland they're sweeping away, and chip shop on corner and chapel, they say. In a bit there'll be no left but bulldozers and clay where we clattered to mill of a morning. 
we came to this house and this street when we wed. Our children were born here, O Frank and O Ted, and we hope to be buried from here, but instead we're bound to be flitting in mourning. They offered us chance of an old people's flat, where you walk miles to shop and you can't keep a cat. But we said to each other, it's none come to that wherever we flit to in morning. Oh, Frank didn't want us. Who's under her thumb? Who's posh? Who for shame for his old dad and mum? But Ted, bless him, sent us a wire and said, come. So we're off to Australia in morning. South Street seen its patches of good and bad luck, but we're hanged if we're stopping to see ourselves stuck and our grand years together all trodden in muck when motorway comes some fine morning. So goodbye to Lanks and to old friends and true. It's a heck of a change and a long way to go. But you're never too old to do what your mum do, and that's why we're flitting in morning. The next was written about by a bloke called Maurice Holstock. Um, it um, it's about the hazards of writing uh, to one's loved one. Shakespeare, Shelley, Byron, Keats wrote affectionate conceits in poetic rhyme to their mistresses and ladies fair. Adoration set in rhyme preserved until the end of time. But when I try to do the same today, my girlfriend's name keeps getting in the way. I want to sing the praises of a girl called Gert, but I can't find a suitable rhyme for her, for Gert is not a flirt, she's never pert nor even shirty. She's not a bit of skirt and she's ten years old of thirty. I wish her name were Jane or Rose, I know some lovely rhymes for those, or Pat or Pam or Jean or Joan or any other girl I've known. But Gert, it's disconcerting. I know I'll never find a rhyme for Gert, that's certain. Alfred Tennyson had a good start when he spoke of his flaming heart. But it's fine when you're adored by a girl called Maud. But come into the garden, Gert, it's bound to sound curt. Many other girls there are with names more suitable by far. There's Geraldine from Palmer's Green, a lovely dish of nectarine. There's Joanna from Havana with the South American manner. And even in Market Harbour, there's Barbara. But Gert is all I get for my exertions, and oh, Gert is not the sort to cause diversions. Poor dear Gert, she's not even an introvert. I look upon her parents with my pronounced ingratitude, for her names don't lend themselves to that classic verse. Gert is bad enough, but the second bit is rude, and her middle name is Nelly, which is worse. The saddest part I've yet to tell, for Gert writes poetry as well with one ironic parallel. We think that fate's been rather dirty, both to me and to my Gertie. <laughs> <coughs> Would you believe it? My name's Bertie. Next one uh, was written by Westman Lee in 1926. It could be about one of them, but then again, who knows? 
I'm 67 and a bit short of thatch. I'm a bachelor still and I allers will batch. My married friends laugh and think I'm a chump. But when I look at their wives, I think, mm, I'm no gump. I can sit here in quiet. There's no one to shriek. I'll be wanting more housekeeping money this week. And there's no jumper pattern strewn all round my den. Really, there's not many flies upon Bachelor Ben. I don't want you to think I hate women, because when I was 18, I was hot stuff I was. I used to chase after every young lass. By gum, I've been over a good bit of grass. Why, when I was six, at a local bazaar, I proposed to a girl and asked her papa. When I saw her last week, she'd a family of ten. A right mess she'd have made of old bachelor Ben. There weren't any cinemas when, where you could spoon in the dark, but I made right good use of a seat in the park. But most of the women were a trifle too slick. They were what you call snatchers. They grabbed at you quick. It was fatal to go home to supper with one. I know I once did and I thought I was done. The moment I entered, they shouted, Say when! And out through the door went Bachelor Ben. There was one girl called Rose, who came from fine stock. Her mother said she was the flower of the flock. But Rose went and married the gardener, Jim. Now there's six little rosebuds are climbing round him. And then there was Eileen, a second name Green. She looked like a fairy when she was 19. But nowadays... Irene is fourteen stone ten. Thank the Lord she's not leaning on Bachelor Ben. But every old bachelor must have his joke. But there's one face I see when I sit here and smoke. She would have been mine. But alas, she is gone. And the memory of her is all I have to cling on. There's no weddings where she is, they say. But deep in my heart I feel certain one day when I'm called and I leave my old bachelor den she'll be waiting above for bachelor Ben. Uh, this next one was written by a bloke called Dave Roberts, uh, who lives in Middlewich. He passed it over to me and said he thought I might make a better job of it. Well, it's up to you to decide, not me. In the shoe shop one cold morning, Dad was working very hard, writing out the retail price of pairs of shoes on Vitsit card, when suddenly the door burst open and in came charging Nellie Hughes. Hello Nelly, Ted said brightly, have they come to buy some shoes? Yes, she said, therefore our Winston, him as lives with Auntie Rose. She looked around the shop, then pointed, Them's nice. Let's have three of those. By heck, said Ted, your Winston must be doing well at school. Three pairs of shoes, how very generous. Nelly Scow, don't be a fool, do you think I'm made of money? I can't afford three pairs of shoes. Three single shoes is what I'm after. Ted said they only come in twos. 
Besides, why would the lad need three shoes? That's one too many, can't you see? Nelly tutted with annoyance. I don't know, Ted. You tell me. It's been three years since I've seen Winston, back when he was only ten. Auntie's written me a letter saying how he's changed since then. He's got a new school uniform. He's neat. He's clean. His hair's been cut. But here's the bit that's got me flummoxed. She says... He's grown another foot. Next one is another one by Weston and Lee, which was written back in um, uh, 1915. Still funny, though. It, um, uh, you are free to join in the chorus on this one. Um, see how you go on with it. Sammy was a sailor, a sailor big and broad, shipped on board a whaler, then tumbled overboard. Sammy said, now save me. Someone said, go hang. The sharks are sniffing round you, then his shipmate sang. Swim, Sam, swim, Sam, swim, Sam. Show them, show your swimmer. Swim like a snow white swan, Sam. You know how a snow white swan swam. Six sharks, shivering sharks are going to snap your limb. A swim well swam is a well swam swim. So swim, Sam, swim, Sam, swim. Sammy swam with vigour. The race had just begun. The sharks all eyed his figures. Oh, jelly, shouted one. Then a portly porpoise popped up into the foam and said, if you want to catch the last boat home, swim, Sam, swim, Sam, swim, Sam. Show them you're some swimmer. Swim like a snow white swan, Sam. You know how a snow white swan swam. Six shark shivering sharks are going to snap your limb. But a swim well swim is a well swim swim. So swim, Sam, swim, Sam, swim. The sharks joined in the chorus in the foaming brine. Ragtime ditties bore us, but by gum this is fine. They struggled with their S's. Until they got yard, And Sammy left them singing as he climbed on board. Swim, Sam, swim, Sam, swim, Sam. Show them you're some swimmer. Swim like a snow white swan, Sam. You know how a snow white swan swam. Six sharks, shivering sharks are going to snap your limb. But a swim well swam is a well swam swim. So swim, Sam, swim, Sam, swim. Finish off with um, one that comes from the United States of America. I found out recently that it was written by a bloke called Lou Sully and published in the Minnesota Heritage Songbook. And um, it, uh, it, uh, it is, uh, I've been doing this for quite some time, so it's, uh, it's nice to know where it actually came from. That was in 1902. I started on a work journey just about a week ago for the little town of Morrow in the state of Ohio. I never was a traveller and really didn't know that Morrow had been ridiculed a century or so. I went down to the depot for my ticket and applied for tips regarding Morrow, interviewed the station guide. Said I, my friend, I want to go tomorrow and return not later than tomorrow because I haven't time to burn. Said he to me, now let me see if I have heard you right. You want to go tomorrow and come back tomorrow night. 
You should have gone tomorrow, yesterday, and back today. For if you'd started yesterday, tomorrow, don't you see, you would have got tomorrow and returned today at three. The train that started yesterday, now understand me right, today it gets tomorrow and comes back tomorrow night. Said I, my boy, it seems to me you're talking through your hat. Is there a town named Morrow on your line? Now tell me that. There is, said he, and take from me a quiet little tip. To go from here tomorrow is a fourteen-hour trip. The train that goes tomorrow leaves today 8.35. Half after ten tomorrow is the time it should arrive. Now if from here tomorrow is a 14 hour ride, can you go today, tomorrow, and come back today, he cried. Said I, I want to go tomorrow, can I go today and get tomorrow by tonight if there is no delay? Well, well, said he, explain to me and I've no more to say, can you go anywhere tomorrow and come back today? For if today you get tomorrow, Surely you'll agree you should have started not today, but yesterday, you see. If you go tomorrow leaving here today, you're flat. You won't get in tomorrow till the day that follows that. If you go tomorrow, you will surely land tomorrow in tomorrow, not today, you understand. For the train that goes tomorrow, if the schedule is right... We'll get you in tomorrow about tomorrow night. Said I, I guess you know it all, but kindly let me say, how can I get tomorrow if I leave the town today? Said he, you cannot get tomorrow any more today, for the train that goes tomorrow is a mile upon its way. I was so disappointed I could only wildly stare. The train had gone tomorrow and left me standing there. The man was right in telling me I was a howling jay. I didn't go tomorrow, so I guess I'll go today. <laughs>